welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 13 Dave Arneson. So last week, we did a deep dive into the life and times of Gary Gygax. This week, we're going to dig into the life of the co creator of Dungeons and Dragons, Dave Arneson. Now, I can guarantee you two things. One, this episode is not going to be an hour long like last week's was. And two, some of Dave's history gets a bit messy, and that's because of how he's been reported over the years. So with all that in mind, let's get moving. David Lance Arneson was born in Hennepin County, Minnesota on October 1st, 1947. There hasn't been a ton of stuff really published about Dave's early life, and I believe it's because of his preference to keep his personal life as private as he could. What we do know for certain is that at some point in the 1960s, while Dave was a teenager, he got really into wargaming. In fact, Dave's big inspiration into wargaming was the same as his eventual partner, Gary Gygax, Avalon Hill's then new game, Gettysburg. What makes Dave's story a little bit different is what he did next. First, he taught all his friends how to play the game. Next, they started working together to design and create their own games. They would also take existing games and develop new and different ways to play them. It was during this time that Dave first started experimenting with some of the role-playing elements he would later put into his Blackmore setting. And, being a student of history, he was able to create games that had a real historical feel to them so that he could play them with his friends. In the late 1960s, Dave joined the Midwest Military Simulation Association, MMSA, which is a group of miniature war gamers and military figurine collectors located in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Also a part of the MMSA when Dave joined was David Wesley, who would later design the game that Dave would expand on to create his Blackmore campaign. During this same time, Dave went to college at the University of Minnesota. Much as you might expect, he majored in history. It has been reported in several sources that Dave liked to role-play historical situations, though instead of being true to history, he would utilize an alternative what-if scenario to make his points, much like he'd been doing in his war games. Also, it's been noted in several sources that Dave also utilized some of the role-playing techniques he would polish later on, though no source I checked would identify exactly what those techniques were that he was using at the time. Backtracking just a little bit, David Wesley has asserted during several interviews over the years that Dave started developing what we would today call the foundations of modern role-playing games during the game sessions of Wesley's Bronstein games that he had created and refereed. In fact, Wesley claims that Dave worked out the one-to-one -one scale that's still used today by focusing on non-combat objectives. At the time, that was very different from what was going on in war games. Dave was a regular player in Wesley's war game scenarios and eventually began running his own scenarios, expanding them to include ideas from sources as different as the Lord of the Rings and Dark Shadows. When Wesley was drafted into the army, this was the late 60s, remember, Dave took over the Bronsteins from his friend, running them in different eras with different settings. And by this point, he'd also become a member of the International Federation of Wargamers, IFW, which we discussed a bit during last week's show. It was around this time that Dave met Gary Gygax. As we've discussed a couple of different times, they met at the second Gen Con in August of 1969. Wargaming was still the main focus of the con at that time, and Gary and Dave found that they shared multiple interests in war games with one specific being their love of sailing ship games. This led the two of them to co-create the naval battle rules, Don't Give Up the Ship. They were initially serialized from June 1971, which is how a number of war game rules were published at the time, though they were later published as a single book by Guiden Games in 1972, then later revised and reprinted by TSR in 1975. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Dave took over the Bronstein games when David Wesley was drafted into the Army Reserves in October of 1970. 
Dave took the opportunity to develop a version of the game where his players played fantasy versions of themselves in the medieval barony of Blackmoor, which he filled with a variety of fantasy monsters. As one might expect, this new setting grew quickly as the players came to enjoy the game and further develop their characters. Dave matched the growth by devising new scenarios whereby his players would quest for magic and gold, escort caravans, lead armies for or against the forces of evil, and delve into the dungeons beneath Castle Blackmoor. At this point, if you're an experienced D&D player, you're probably seeing the same thing I did when I started the research for this episode. Blackmoor is starting more and more to resemble what will become Dungeons & Dragons. The scenarios definitely match up, and most of the basic parts of a D&D campaign are there. Now, it should be noted that the game was still using miniatures, as it was still, to some extent, a war game. For Castle Blackmoor, Dave used a Kibri kit model of Brenzel Castle, just in case you were really looking to replicate it. In July of 1998, Dave was profiled in Dragon Magazine, and he explained what inspired him to create Blackmoor. I'm lifting the entire quotation from that article. I'd spent the previous two days watching about five monster movies on Channel 5's Creature Feature Weekend, reading several Conan books, I cannot recall which ones, but I always thought they were all pretty much the same, and stuffing myself with popcorn, doodling on a piece of graph paper. At the time, I was quite tired of my nappy campaign with all its rigid rules, and I was rebelling against it. By the way, when Dave said his nappy campaign, he was referring to the Napoleonic campaigns he'd been typically running to this point. Needless to say, what he created next changed the gaming world forever. Now, this has been discussed ad nauseum, but for the sake of history, we need to mention it again. When Dave was working on Blackmore, what we know for certain is that he had, at the very least, read Gary Gygax's chainmail rule. How much of those rules he used in Blackmoor and how long those pieces remain in the game have been open to conjecture over the years. In several of the sources I used for my research for this episode, the writers suggested that the fantasy combat table from Chainmail was a specific piece of material Dave utilized. However, it was also reported that he didn't like it, didn't find it suitable for his needs, and dropped it nearly as quickly as he'd inserted it into his game. Regardless of things such as how much and how long, what we can confirm for certain is that Dave came up with rules of his own. For inspiration, Dave adapted elements from the revision of the Civil War Ironclad game he'd done previously. If you play D&D today, you'd recognize a lot of the changes Dave made to Blackmore at the time. They used hit points in armor class. Characters went through a development phase. Oh, and this was probably the first game that utilized the concept of the dungeon crawl. But Dave didn't stop there. He continued to flesh out the game, and it should be noted that Blackmore is still being played today. Now, we can credit or blame Blackmore for many of the fantasy medieval tropes of D&D today. I mentioned the dungeon crawl just a minute ago. That's probably the biggest trope in D&D today, but not the only one. But Blackmore didn't limit itself to medieval. It also incorporated time travel and science fiction into the play. Now, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, a lot of these elements are shown later on down the line when TSR publishes the DA module series Dave creates, with City of the Gods being the one most fans would know best. However, a number of writers have noted that these elements were also present from the early 1970s in a parallel game run by a fellow named John Snyder, whose game produced a rule set that TSR was going to publish in 1974 as the first science fiction role-playing game. And before someone suggests I'm saying Dave stole anything, I'm not. Dave has been credited by everyone I've read for the creative. John Snyder has been noted as someone who was interested more in the science fiction side of the game and intertwined his games with Dave's games. So what John was doing had, if not in a printed form, at least a verbal form, Dave's blessings for what he was doing. Dave Arneson said it best himself in the same Dungeon Magazine article I quoted above. Blackmore is role-playing in non-traditional medieval setting. I have things such as steam powder, gunpowder, and submarines in limited numbers. There was even a tank running around for a while. The emphasis is on the story and the role-playing. Now, as a DM myself, reading this, I noted, as some of you may have, that many of the things Dave was talking about being in Blackmore are the types of things that some DMs would utilize in steampunk-flavored D&D games. 
hell in Critical Role and not another D&D podcast, they've had characters who were literally gunslingers. So Dave was doing this stuff 40 years earlier. It was a trendsetter in ways he couldn't have imagined at the time. With Blackmore becoming established as Dave's home game, it began to get some publication. Details of the game were first published in issue 13 of the Domesday Book, which was the newsletter of the Castle and Crusade Society. Issue 13 dropped in July of 1972. Later on, it was expanded and published as the first fantasy campaign by Judges Guild in 1977. By the way, if you get your hands on a copy of that, you should be warned that for all the information about Blackmore that it contains, there's no game system in it. It's a setting and you'll have to figure out what system to utilize if you want to play it. Now, as I've reported in several episodes of this show, Dave and Dave Muggery met with Gary Gygax in Lake Geneva in November of 1972 to demonstrate both Blackmore and Dungeon. As further reported last week, Dave ran the Lake Geneva crew through their first session of Blackmore. Rob Koontz is the person providing most of the information about this session, noting that Dave was the GM, with the players being Gary Gygax, Ernie Gygax, Terry Koontz, and Rob Koontz. Rob Koontz also noted that Dave Maggery was playing as well and took the position of de facto leader of the group because he knew and understood the rules of the game. Later, in Wargaming Magazine, Rob Koontz provided the following. Gary, myself, and a few other local wargamers were the first lucky fellows from Lake Geneva to experience the rigors of Blackmore. This idea caught on deeply with Gary after an exciting adventure in which our party of heroes fought a troll, were fireballed by a magic user, then fled to the outdoors, being chased by that magic user and his minions, fought four balrogs, followed a map to 16 ogres, and destroyed them with a wish from a sword we'd procured from the hapless troll earlier. Like, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty kick-ass game session to me. But you have to put it into perspective. Nobody was gaming quite like this at the time. Sure, Gary Gygax had created the chainmail rules for miniature gaming, but to do what was done in this particular session just wasn't done at the time. So to be at a table for the first time and experience all of what Rob Koontz was describing had to be cool. Getting back into the narrative, I mentioned last week what Gary Gygax's response to his Blackmore session was, and noted that he and Dave began collaborating by phone and mail to hammer out the rules for what would eventually become Dungeons & Dragons. I've also noted on several occasions that the final published version of D&D was more Gygax than Arneson, and that's been reported to be the case by every writer I've researched. In fact, it's been noted that Dave had a version of the rules that he was quite proud of, and that draft was never used. However, Dave was able to get a lot of his Blackmore specific material published by TSR. The Blackmore supplement was released in 1975 and it provided more rules for D&D and though it was mostly Dave's rules from the original game, it wasn't nearly as much as what his final draft for the original game would have been. He also included a sample dungeon from his original campaign, which by the way was the first published RPG scenario in a professional publication. And Blackmore introduced the Monk and the Assassin to the game, along with presenting some new monsters and the first published role-playing game adventure ever, The Temple of the Frog. In 1976, Dave formally and officially joined TSR in a paid position, taking the title of Director of Research. However, he left the company at the end of that year, preferring instead to continue his career as an independent game designer. Now let's talk about that for a minute. Most of you probably heard about that and wondered why he would do something like that. After all, he had a steady job working for an up-and-coming company. Why would he want to leave that to head back into the world on his own? Look, I can't speak for Dave Arneson, and Dave himself didn't share a whole lot of information about his decision over the years. So what I'm about to say is my opinion, based on what I know about the game industry as a whole, combined with my own experiences. The first thing to consider is that as director of research, Dave would have most likely been limited to developing games for TSR. And as we all know from the narratives to this point, at that time, TSR meant Gary Gygax. So one must assume that no matter how good a project was in the mind of Dave Arneson, if Gygax didn't like it or think it would work, it probably didn't get a chance to move forward. I would also guess, but it's just an educated guess on my part, that some of that development was also for more products specific to the D&D line. 
since Dave's thoughts on the game weren't utilized as he might have liked for the original release, this would have required him to alter his own game ideas to the system Gygax had published. While I never knew either man, I do know that if it were me, it would be difficult to alter my idea for something to fit the system that someone else decided would be what we used without consulting me first. One final thought on this is what Dave's advantages would be working independently. It would allow him to work for whatever company he wanted to do business with, or would do business with him, working on whatever type of game or system he wanted to work on. He wouldn't be limited to just the TSR brand. While that's taken a hell of a chance, I can certainly understand his reasoning. Dave did do TSR one more favor, publishing the Dungeon Master's Index in 1977. It was a 38-page booklet that indexed all of TSR's D&D properties as of that point in time. One assumes he was paid for that work, but I was unable to confirm it. Next up is the situation that changed the nature of the relationship between Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax for the rest of their lives. And this has been noted in previous episodes, but look, I need to mention it again in detail for context. When Dave left TSR, the company agreed to pay him a royalty on all D&D products. But in 1977, TSR split the brand into D&D and Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, or AD&D. TSR claimed that AD&D was a significantly different product, and therefore Dave was not due royalties on it. Dave wasn't having that. He filed the first of five lawsuits against Gary Gygax and TSR in 1979. In March of 1981, the suits were settled out of court. However, the settlement agreement was to be confidential. What was announced officially was that, moving forward, Gygax and Dave would be credited as co-creators of all D&D products moving forward, and Dave would be paid a 2.5% royalty on all AD&D products. For the record, that gave him a six-figure annual income for the next 20 years. And according to several of my sources, that six figures was quite comfortable. Okay, so that's the basics of the situation, which is pretty much the way I've presented it every time I've presented it to this point. However, you and I both know there had to be a whole hell of a lot more to it. And we'll examine those things after we take a quick time out. So before the break, I said there had to be a hell of a lot more to the situation between the lawsuits between Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax and TSR? Well, there was. In doing my research for several of these episodes, I came upon a number of interviews with various people involved with Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, TSR, or the lawsuits themselves over the years, and they brought up a number of interesting points. Now, I've already incorporated several of those, including the specifics about Blackmore vs. Greyhawk and how they impacted what became D&D. I've also noted how much of Dave's original game and game style was transferred to the new game. What others have been able to add to the narrative over the years is quite enlightening. According to several sources, AD&D was developed for two reasons. One, to provide a more advanced form of the game, with more rules and objectives for players to use. And two, to avoid having to pay more money to Dave Arneson. Now, the sources who admit to that second point all note that you'll never find a piece of written documentation to prove it. However, they all point to the language TSR used in their arguments against Dave's suits. It's significantly different from the original. It has very little, if anything, in common with the original. It isn't meant to be compatible with the original. Sounds an awful lot like trying to cut Dave out of the mix to me, but I may be suffering from information bias on this one. If you're looking for more on this, not to mention more on the creation of the game itself from a source not tied to Gary Gygax or Wizards of the Coast, I watched a documentary called The Secrets of Blackmore that came out a couple of years ago. They interview a lot of folks who were around Dave when Blackmore was created, and as Dave went through the creative process with Gygax for D&D. They have a lot of interesting things to say about the situation. If you're interested, I caught it on Amazon's streaming service, but it might be available on others. Check your preferred streaming service to find out. One more interesting thing I dug up in my research, and probably what caused Gygax to settle with Dave without a court order, is this. In at least two of the suits, the judges in the case agreed that Dave was the creative soul behind D&D. Now that might not sound like much, but if you dig into legal sites a bit, 
being considered the creative soul or the creative innovator or, or whatever they call it of a project goes a very long way towards determining who is considered a creator of a product and how much credit they should get. So, by being legally considered the creative soul of Dungeons & Dragons, it doesn't matter how the rules get changed. Dave Arneson is still considered to be a co-creator of the product. In fact, I read an interview with Dave from the early 2000s, and when he was asked about his creator status, he said only that, quote, I have papers from two courts of law who say I'm the creator. That's all I need. End quote. So, to summarize, Dave wanted what he believed he was due, TSR didn't want to give it to him, but ultimately, in my opinion, they realized that if the courts decided the case, they'd have to pay a whole hell of a lot more than they might want to, so they settled. And if I'm being honest here, Dave Arneson deserves some credit for being willing to settle. If he'd been an asshole about the whole thing, he could have insisted on taking the process to its logical conclusion and allow a judge to rule. Who knows what he could have gotten out of that. I think it's safe to speculate that if he had, it would have changed the trajectory of TSR forever, but I don't necessarily believe it would have been a negative thing. But we'll never know. So with the lawsuit settled, let's get back into Dave's life. I mentioned the Judges Guild publishing of the first fantasy campaign in 1977. Obviously, that's no longer in print, and I'm unable to find it from any of my usual PDF sources. But I'm going to keep digging, and if I can find it anywhere, I'll report back to you. In 1979, Dave joined forces with Richard L. Snyder, who was one of his original Blackmore players, to co-author Adventures in Fantasy, which was an attempt to put into print the spirit of the original game Dave had envisioned D&D to be, rather than the game that was ultimately published. Adventures in Fantasy got poor reviews. Reviewers hammered it on its price point, which was much higher than other games on the market at the time, the nature of the rules, which were considered to be complicated, and the various illustrations, which were reported to be poor. However, almost all reviewers admitted that once they'd gotten through those issues and had simplified the rules a bit, the game was fun to play. In the early 1980s, Dave decided to set up his own game company. Called Adventure Games, Dave staffed it primarily with his friends, and those friends were also mostly involved in a Civil War reenactment group. The company released the miniature games Harpoon in 1981 and Johnny Reb in 1983. Dave also took advantage of having his own company to release a new edition of Adventures in Fantasy in 1981. They were also able to publish a half dozen books related to Tecumel, which is a series of books written by M.A.R. Barker. The company was able to do this because of Dave's friendship with Barker. So, Adventure Games was profitable and fairly successful. However, Dave realized at some point that the workload was a whole lot more than what he wanted at that point in his life. One of the reasons for that feeling might also have been the fact that Dave got married in 1984. That year, he and Frankie Ann Morneau tied the knot. They'd remain married for the rest of Dave's life. They had one daughter, Malia, and two grandchildren. And by the way, Malia, if I mispronounce your name, I deeply apologize. Doing the best I can here. Dave tended to keep his personal life private, so that's going to be all the information I'll be providing about his wife, his daughter, and his grandchildren. And if I'm honest, I'm okay with that. Dave's personal life was his, and I'm good with letting it stay that way. So with Dave's dislike of the workload, he needed a solution. That solution was to sell the company to Flying Buffalo. Flying Buffalo officially picked up the rights to Adventure Games in 1985, and since Dave owned a portion of Flying Buffalo, he handed over the rest of the company's stock and intellectual property when he shut the company down. So, with Dave back working as an independent again, gaming fans were curious about what his next project would be. In a case of Hell Froze Over, Dave surprised everyone by reconnecting with Gary Gygax and TSR. Dave took advantage of the opportunity to reconnect Blackmore with D&D, &D, creating the DA series of modules. For the record, the DA tag on those stands for, you got it, Dave Arneson. There were four modules in the DA series, all set in Blackmore, and all four were published between 1986 and 1987. More specifically, they were titled Adventures in Blackmore, Temple of the Frog, both of those were released in 1986, City of the Gods, and The Dookie of Ten, those were released in 1987. 
Dave co-wrote the first three with David J. Ritchie, and Ritchie wrote the fourth one by himself. This module series was the first time Dave was really able to detail the Blackmore campaign setting in the D&D world. Sure, there'd been stuff released a decade earlier, but it was more watered down than the DA modules were, and it gave fans a really good look at what Blackmore could be. It should also be noted that there was supposed to be a fifth module in this series, but if you're paying attention to dates, modules 3 and 4 came out shortly before Gary Gygax was shown the door at TSR. Once Lorraine Williams took over the company, she shelved the rest of the project and cut ties with Dave. Now, shortly before all that happened, Dave had written another D&D module set in Blackmore, The Garbage Pits of Despair, and it was published in Different Worlds magazine in issues 42 and 43. In 1988, Dave stated his belief that role-playing games, regardless of their medium, were pretty much just hack and slash. He was concerned that they didn't teach novice players how to play, and name-dropped games like Ultima 4 as games that, quote, have stood pretty much alone as quirks instead of trendsetters, end quote, in teaching new gamers how to play and not necessarily being hack and slash gamers. For the record, a hack and slash game is pretty much what it sounds like. Characters fight their way through everything with little to no role play or storytelling involved. I am guilty personally of running way too many games like this over the years, so when I define hack and slash, I can do so from my own experiences. Now, Dave could have just criticized the game industry as a whole and left it at that. However, that's not the kind of guy he was. Instead of just pulling a mic drop and walking off, he decided to be the change he wanted to see. He stepped into the computer industry, founding 4D Interactive Systems in his home state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, 4D has since folded. Dave also started doing computer programming and computer game creation of his own, eventually consulting with other computer companies. However, he kept his toes in the tabletop world as well, and in 1989, he wrote the adventure DNA slash DOA, which was the first adventure released for the FAFSA game Shadowrun which was also released that year. DNA DOA was criticized by a lot of reviewers for being, basically, a cyberpunk dungeon crawl. However, having looked at it myself, while I can see the criticism, I could also see how this adventure would work in teaching gamers who'd only played D&D how to play the Shadowrun system, which is, by the way, complicated at times. From a personal standpoint, Dave had moved to California. Living there in the late 1980s, he'd begun working with children in special education classes. When he moved back to Minnesota, he continued that work, speaking at schools about the educational uses of role-playing and using multi-sided dice to teach math. Speaking of multi-sided dice, I've been looking for the right place to put this little nugget of information, so let's do it here. In the Gary Gygax episode last week, I credited him for introducing dice other than six-siders to the game world. However, as I was completing my research for this episode, I came across something that brings this claim into question. During a print interview about 20 years ago, someone asked him about bringing 20-sided dice into the game world, so I assumed they'd been tipped off about it. In the interview itself, Dave noted that he'd been in the UK at one point and had seen 20-sided dice at an education shop of some sort. Realizing what those dice could do for his game, he purchased some, brought them home, and began using them. Now, I went back to try to find the exact interview so that I could give it credit and quote it here, but I was unable to locate it. Thank you, Google. However, Dave did mention specifically using counters and spinners in games previously, much as we discussed in last week's episode, and the timeline would match up approximately with Dave's creation of Blackmore. So if I'm right on the timeline, we may have yet another innovation to thank Dave for. As the 80s passed into the 90s, Dave found a new passion. He began working at Full Sail University, which is a private university that focuses on multimedia. In fact, they have a game design program that is considered to be among the best in the world. Dave continued to work there as an instructor of computer game design until 2008. One class in particular that he taught was Rules of the Game. In this class, he taught his students how to accurately document and create rule sets for games, balancing them between mental and physical challenges for the players. Dave resigned his position on June 19th, 2008. Also during the 90s, Dave was invited to Brazil by the game publisher Devere. 
Through that trip, he became friends with the owner of the publishing company and gifted him his original D&D wood grain box set as well as some of his original D&D books. Speaking of D&D, after Wizards of the Coast purchased TSR in 1997, Peter Ackeson paid Dave an undisclosed amount of money to purchase the last of Dave's royalty rights, which then freed up Wizards to revert the overall title of the game back to Dungeons & Dragons in 2000, as Atkinson had also purchased Gary Gygax's rights previously. Around 2000, Dave began working with videographer John Kentner on a video documentary about the early history of role-playing games. Titled Dragons in the Basement, it was envisioned to be a series of interviews with original players and designers of the games to discuss the creation of the hobby. However, the documentary was never released, though I don't know if it's because it was unfinished or because of distribution issues. Though with streaming now an option, I have to assume it was the former. It should also be noted that Dave had a cameo appearance in the original Dungeons & Dragons movie. He was in a group of mages throwing fireballs at a dragon. Oh, you don't remember seeing that scene? Yeah, it, it got cut from the final product. Somewhere around this time, Dave joined up with Dustin Klingman to found Zeitgeist Games, with their focus being an updated D20 version of the Blackmore setting. Goodman Games would have the honor of releasing the finished product titled Dave Arneson's Blackmore in 2004. Goodman Games dropped additional Blackmore product in 2005. When D&D 4th Edition dropped, Code Monkey Publishing released Dave Arneson's Blackmore, the first campaign in 2009. Dave never stopped gaming. There was an annual meeting of players in Minnesota who played the original Blackmore, and Dave rarely, if ever, missed a session, no matter where he was. He also played D&D, despite his dislike of how the creative process went, and played his beloved military miniature games. After battling cancer for two years, Dave Arneson passed away on April 7, 2009. Since Gary Gygax had passed the year prior, Dave's death brought to a close the saga of the creators of the world's most popular role-playing game. And Dave's death brought with it the kind of tributes he should have been able to celebrate while he was alive. Three days after he passed, Wizards of the Coast temporarily replaced the front page of the D&D section of their website with a tribute to Dave. Order of the Stick and Dork Tower published cartoon tributes. Activision Blizzard posted a tribute to Dave on their website, then on April 14, 2009, released Patch 3.1 of World of Warcraft and dedicated it to Dave. Dungeons & Dragons Online added an in-game memorial altar to Dave in the ruins of Thrinal. Full Sail University paid tribute to Dave as well, dedicating the student game development studio space as Dave Arneson's Blackmore Studios on October 30th, 2010. However, for all of Dave's achievements, he was, as I've said more than once, under-recognized in the game community for all of his achievements. Over the past 13 years, though, this has changed. Thanks to a number of releases, including a scholarly work by John Peterson called Playing at the World in 2012, Dave's contributions to the game are finally being recognized more. Robert Kuntz published a book, Dave Arneson's True Genius, in 2017, and detailed how much Dave was involved in designing the tabletop role-playing game. And, as I mentioned, the documentary The Secrets of Blackmore addresses just how involved Dave was in the creation of the hobby so many of us love today. So, we salute you, Dave Artisan. Godspeed be to you. And with that, we end today's tour. Next week, we're going to look at the live play phenomenon. From Acquisitions Incorporated to Critical Role and more, we'll look at how this area of the role-playing world came to be and try to figure out why the hell it's so popular. As we close, you may have noticed, we've got some music to play us in, and it's going to play us out too. It comes from Pixabay.com, so if you're looking for some free music to use for your project, check them out. Also, wanted to repeat my deal from last week. If you're listening to this in the UK and are looking to get back out to game in a social setting, reach out to Ace on Twitter at BookMuse, at B-O-O-K-M-E-W-S. They're working on trying to get some store events going on and are definitely looking for players.
As always, I have to give you all of the shout out and credit because if you're not listening, I'm not producing product. Though I suppose I could just do all this stuff for my grandson as bedtime stories, but I'm pretty sure my daughter wouldn't approve. So keep listening and keep my family life sane. Thank you. You can check us out on Facebook, Role Playing History Podcast, Twitter at Role Playing History Podcast, or use the hashtag Role Playing History Podcast. YouTube, we've got a channel, Role Playing History Podcast. Click on the subscribe button and hit the bell for alerts when new stuff drops. And as always, you can email us at roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. So, next week, it's live play, live stream games. <laughs> God, this ought to be interesting. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're Role Playing History. History.